Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Bert. Um, I'd like to make this presentation somewhat interactive. Uh, we have approximately an hour or maybe a few minutes less. So if you have questions or comments in between, I'd be happy to uh, entertain them. Uh, challenges, disagreements with what I might say, and maybe I'll ask you some questions along the way also. I'm concentrating, <clears throat> well, I'll put it a different way. Um, I'm not going to address the actual clinical encounters or the kind of encounters that take place during a disaster because I'm assuming that Drs. Lepora and Dr. Kelleher will address more of those and <clears throat> certainly have more knowledge about that. My expertise is, I'm afraid to say, only in books, not in actual uh, disaster relief. But what I will <clears throat> bring out are some lessons learned and particularly from some of the uh, disasters that have occurred uh, in the United States and particularly in, in uh, New York City and in, in other areas. So that may, the examples may help us to, um, to understand. So let's see, I can use this. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about ethical principles. Don't all mention ethical principles, and we always have to sort of mention what they are, because after all, we, in the field of bioethics, and my background's in philosophy, um, we'll look at the principles and see which ones apply. So my claim, then, is that principles of bioethics do apply, but with limitations in certain circumstances. Um, the principle of beneficence, which basically says maximize good consequences and minimize bad consequences, uh, it's such a, a common sense principle that it doesn't uh, really deserve that uh, fancy name that the bioethicists have given to it. But basically it means do good, but that's not enough. It's take whatever steps are necessary to maximize good consequences and minimize bad consequences. So clearly that's applicable as it is um, in our daily lives as well as in um, applications of bioethics. Respect for autonomy, uh, sometimes those of us from the United States are criticized as being too autonomy oriented because of the uh, rampant individualism that infects people in the United States. Um, but we all believe that we should respect autonomy and certainly Europeans as well as Asians and others. So this is not by any means unique to North America that there's respect for autonomy. Um, in the case of disasters, the principle of autonomy does apply as it does in other areas of research. That is, when one is conducting research, one of the cardinal bedrock principles is that individuals should know that they're being in research. They should be informed about what research activities, maneuvers, or interventions there are, and they must voluntarily consent to be a subject in research. This is true in research and disasters, about which I'll speak a little bit more. Um, Donald already mentioned um, <clears throat> the need for research and disasters. So this is a principle that applies equally well <clears throat> in disaster settings. However, the principle of autonomy, as central as it is in bioethics generally, and in clinical care and med medical care, is not applicable when there's a need for the triage of injured persons, or when it's necessary uh, or limited resources must be allocated. Um, one can't ask an individual, uh, do you want to be in the group that we're going to try to save or in the group that we're not going to try to save or, the, or we're going to leave you alone because there are people with more urgent medical needs. This is triage situations in disasters as well as, for that matter, in a clinical setting, an emergency department, for example, in a hospital. This is not where autonomy can readily be exercised. If anybody disagrees with that, you should let me know. But <clears throat> I think it's widely accepted that there are some circumstances in which what is good for the group or for certain members of the group might mean that not everyone can be uh, asked to consent to where, whatever one is being allocated. Please. Sorry, can I just stop you there? Because, um, well, we would, as you say, that's generally kind of accepted. But actually, you see that there's a shift in terms of research happening where that same kind of um, rationale is being applied. That um, and, and as you say, we've always taken a slightly different approach of autonomy being the absolute bedrock, consent mm -hmm. and explicit consent being the bedrock. And yet, we're now seeing a shift um, in terms of the respect for autonomy in the research area as well, saying, well, actually, the common good 
can also be a rationale for actually saying we don't need explicit consent. Can you give an example of where that is being said or written or claimed? Well, for example, I mean, in Europe currently, and, and, and I don't know how it is in, in the US, but certainly we would say we have very strong data protection rules, we have very strong consent rules for research, and they are commonly being um, overridden in terms of saying, well, there's a common good. I mean, certainly for um, infectious disease outbreak and where we could have accepted in a sense, even in that sense. But now we're talking about very general, where we would have gone out and recruited patients in the past for saying, well, the material is, excess material is there in the hospital, why not use it? We're all gonna benefit from it. It's a common good exercise. You shouldn't complain if the material is used and you didn't really know about it. All right, that, that's actually a very interesting point, and um, it would digress too much to pursue it right now, but yeah. maybe we can take it up in discussion or at some point. Uh, since here, uh, the nature of the research is the use of people's data, um, limited, as you say, with confidentiality and security protections, and perhaps, or not perhaps, but actually the use of samples that have been taken for clinical care, where one might want to do research involving those samples. So in those kinds of cases, I agree, there is a shift. That shift already occurred in the United States some time ago. Um, but what it does not involve is, unless you're gonna, you have other examples, does not involve interventions on the person. That is to say, well, we're going to do a little research maneuver on people uh, because uh, the doctors are interested in that. I mean, that, it seems to me, the line is still there. Um, I, so we can discuss this a little further, but you're right. In the past, there was more concern about the confidentiality of people's information, clinical records, et cetera. Uh, but that's now being, that's uh, uh, shifted. Um, and there, of course, it's not harm to the person because there's no medical or, or intervention, but it could be harm to people's interests if there's information that's revealed, and that's the point about data security and protections. I thought you were gonna mention, and I'll just stick this part in, that it, at least in some recent articles and, and uh, contributions to the New England Journal of Medicine, there are people arguing that comparative effectiveness research, where you're comparing two different current treatments, uh, they can be two drugs that have been approved by a regulatory agency or any other um, um, type of intervention where they're, in, they're used in clinical practice routinely, and now you're going to randomize people and study that, um, and there are people who are saying, you don't need consent for that because this is standard of care. Well, I'm opposed to that, and if we want to discuss that further, we can, but that's another area in which uh, informed consent is being eroded somewhat. Okay, I'm glad for your intervention, and others should do similarly. So, um, the principle of justice, uh, which is one of the three or four cardinal principles of bioethics, is uh, much more complex. There's not only one principle of justice, why I put a little s there, and how one applies uh, justice uh, in general in bioethics um, has some complexities, but particularly in the area of disaster research, because what does it mean? What would it mean to apply the principle of justice? This is only one example and we'll look at some more examples when, we, uh, when I um, present some of the information about the disasters in the United States. And that is fairness is at the heart of the, of the concept of justice and procedural fairness as opposed to substantive fairness. Procedural fairness means you have to have fair procedures for, div for making decisions. Uh, it can't be arbitrary, and I guess the worst violation from an ethical standpoint would be decision makers who have a conflict of interest. So fairness requires that uh, there be no conflict of interest and that there be procedures in place for making decisions. This is particularly true in triage situations where the people who are actually performing the medical treatments or medical um, activities uh, should not be themselves the decision makers on the whole of who gets to be triaged into which group. So it's called procedural fairness because there have to be proper steps set up, a process for decision making, whether it's triage or other, other activities such as research al resource allocation. Um, just to mention what I mean here by research, resource allocation, triage is clear. It's dividing people into um, groups. Um, I'll give ex examples of that. Uh, resource allocation can occur 
prospectively, uh, when decisions are made, how a limited resource in a particular situation should be allocated. And I'm going to give some examples of um, um, infectious disease outbreaks and, and pandemics where <clears throat> uh, uh, plans should be in place. You don't just wait for uh, the outbreak or the pandemic. You uh, make some plans in advance. So, um, and uh, the other point about a principle of justice would be emergency response and post-disaster justice. And post-disaster justice has more to do with um, the resources in a community. <clears throat> For example, a very poor area uh, where um, the resources do not exist and how one brings resources to a poor area rather than just focusing on the wealthier portions of town if there are poor areas and, and wealthier areas. So again, I'll have examples of these, but just to keep these in mind in the background. Um, sip of water here, my throat is. <clears throat> um, traditionally, it seems, I didn't know this until I started studying disaster ethics at the, at the, at the feet of Bird and, and Donal in the, in the conference, but traditionally it seems there was a distinction made between man-made versus natural disasters. And this apparently is um, uh, in, in the literature and just in ordinary conversation. Uh, Hank Tenhave, who is one of the, um, uh, the authors in the book, um, said the following, what makes an event into a disaster is its impact on human beings. Um, <clears throat> and he mentions an example of, you know, a hurricane or a storm or a tsunami or whatever in an, in an uninhabited place. Well, the, the um, uh, destruction may be just as widespread and just as serious, but if there are no human beings on an uninhabited island, it's not considered and should not be considered a disaster. Um, but, as I'll give in a couple of quick examples, even a natural disaster has a human component that makes its impact more or less on humans. So, um, this may depend upon the preparedness and the response, and again, I'll have some examples of that, uh, what the impact will be on human beings uh, given the, the preparedness. So there are clear examples of man-made uh, disaster, and let me give a, example, a couple of those. One is uh, Chernobyl, um, and the other is Bhopal. Um, those of you unfamiliar with it, I'm going to tell you about that in a moment. And then a combination was the tsunami and Fukushima nuclear accident in Japan because the natural disaster clearly was the tsunami. I mean, there was this earthquake under the ocean and this unexpectedly large tsunami uh, um, um, washed over the northern part of uh, the um, uh, Japanese island. But the, because there was a nuclear plant, Fuk Fukushima, this was the man-made part, and so questions could arise. Were the preparations adequate? Were the workers in the nuclear, um, in the nuclear plant um, adequate, and so the nuclear accident followed the natural disaster. So there are other combinations like that. So here is Chernobyl. This is actually a picture, and I had a, um, a note on that that doesn't show up here, so let me read my note. This was 1986 in Ukraine, which was then the Ukraine uh, Social SSR, maybe again for all we know. Uh, the worst nuclear accident in history, both in terms of costs and in terms of uh, the deaths that resulted. And this resulted from a flawed uh, design, a reactor design, operated with inadequately trained personnel. So you had a flaw in the design that led to the uh, accident, and then you had the personnel who were unable to contain the, the, the damage once it, once it occurred. So clearly, um, this was from the start and all the way through a man-made disaster. There was really nothing natural in, in nature that contributed to that. This is, these are people who are protesting. Of course, they weren't protesting the disaster itself, but this is what the caption says. They were protesting the fact that it occurred and the follow-up. This was 1984, and it was a gas leak in a union carbide pesticide factory in Bhopal, India. 
Now, of course, but Union Carbide is, uh, I think, I guess it's a U United States. I don't know if it's multinational, but it's certainly a United States company. So this shows that even though things were pretty bad there in managing and, and uh, dealing with the plant itself in India, one has to lay blame to the company that failed to do what it should have done uh, initially. More than 500,000 people were exposed to gas and other chemicals. The immediate death toll was very a precise figure here, 2,259, to the best that someone calculated, not I. Um, and estimated, estimates regarding deaths um, were another 8,000 within two weeks, uh, so that's clearly a lot more who were affected and then died, and 8,000 more later. And uh, there were also hundreds and thousands of injuries, some of which were permanently disabled. Uh, disabling. And it's really important in these situations not only to focus on death. Somehow statistics always focus at this many people died and this many people died. But um, at least as important is those people who were injured, some so severely that they never recovered the ability to work, the ability to live, etc. So it's always important to include the morbidity uh, as well as the mortality in these situations. And what these people here in this picture are protesting uh, was the um, inadequacy in the plant itself, that is, that led to, um, of the personnel and the um, uh, circumstances that led to that. So I'm going to uh, say a little bit about pre preparedness. Um, this depends on the type of disaster that we're discussing. That is, both the ability uh, to have adequate preparedness and the nature of the preparedness. Keep me on time if it's going too slowly here. Um, the general preparation for a disaster um, can be done in areas that are prone to specific types of disaster. Now, sometimes you know when it's coming and sometimes you don't know when it's coming. So, for example, the tsunami in Japan, they did have a wall uh, that was supposed to protect against uh, big waves coming in from the ocean. The, wa the wall wasn't tall enough. So uh, clearly they knew, they didn't know that the earthquake was coming because earthquakes are one of those things that you usually can't tell. Uh, I don't know, rumor has it that birds can tell and animals can tell um, beforehand, but people apparently can't. So this is a question of how high you build a wall. Um, in hurricane uh, preparedness, even though there may not be very much time, hurricanes, typhoons, and what's the other thing that's like a typhoon or hurricane? out in the Pacific, so, pardon? Cyclones? Cyclones, yeah, yeah. I, I, there's a bunch of these storm type things. Um, <laughs> you, you, may, you may not know exactly when the particular one is coming, although, I mean, there is a better ability to forecast than there is uh, earthquakes, but it's certainly well known where those things occur. Actually, the one I had forgotten about is tornado. Um, and there are a lot of those in the Midwest of the United States. There were just recently some extreme tornadoes um, in uh, Oklahoma. It was one of the states that is prone to um, uh, tornadoes. So there's an example where you don't know immediately before, or at least you may, you'll know moments before when it's coming. You can't always predict the path of the tornado. They do things like wind around, and then they can pick up whole buildings and automobiles and trucks and things like that. But you certainly know in an area that's prone to tornadoes. So this is why the nature and type of preparedness might differ. Um, an example here, Hurricane Katrina, I'm going to talk more about that and some of the lessons learned from that uh, tragic disaster. Um, there were years of failure in, uh, to strengthen the levees to prevent massive flooding. It was well known that the levees were weak, there were breaches in the levees that the, um, you know, these are the things that keep the, the flooding low. Uh, um, New Orleans is very low. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's low and prone to flooding anyway, but in a case of a hurricane, of course, there's a massive amount of water. So here, it was certainly well known that the levees were not adequately um, uh, um, repaired or, or not adequately put in place in the first place. Um, and it was years, uh, that was known for years. So this is an example of a, a failure of preparedness and, of course, uh, because there's a very large poor population, the whole state of Louisiana is uh, uh, poor, if not 
backward in some respects, like education and caring for medical care, etc. So here you had a sort of compounded problem of a poor state that didn't uh, prepare for disaster, but that doesn't take care of its people in other ways, too. And I, I'm going to have some interesting quotations later. But the imminent arrival of Katrina was predicted. Right? So instead of having big levees that are strong and powerful enough to prevent the flooding, they put some sandbags there. Well, sandbags are pretty common, but it's a, a very small measure that uh, is hardly successful. Um, and there was also a very poorly coordinated local response uh, by the then mayor, uh, who apparently turned out to be very incompetent, if not also corrupt, because he's, still, he's since been indicted and jailed. That is, the one guy who was the mayor at the time of uh, Hurricane Katrina. And there was a poorly uh, coordinated state and federal response. And the director of FEMA, which is the Federal Emergency Management Agency in the United States, um, was he was totally incompetent. He had owned a racetrack or something before he was appointed by George W. Bush, our uh, thankfully gone president. Um, and uh, the, the whole thing was poorly coordinated. The way it works in the United States, I don't know about here, maybe we'll hear about it later, is the local response is the first response. Uh, the local people then, the local person in charge, governmental uh, agency, then has to uh, contact the state. Every state has a Department of Health and some emergency response capacity. And then they have to call in the feds. Well, that's an example of what was not done here. And my own view is that the feds should be able to come in first, or at least uh, simultaneously, uh, in any of these cases, because they're always better prepared. And it would be uh, not only FEMA, the uh, uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency, but also the CDC, which is the uh, United States um, a Public Health Agency that is very competent. So uh, the structure that one little guy has to call a bigger guy, and the bigger guy has to call another bigger guy, uh, may lead to delays and poor coordination. And that's what happened in, um, in Katrina. Here is uh, only one picture. You know, this whole presentation and every, anybody's presentation could be completely filled with um, all of these pictures. But, you know, if you're talking about disasters, you have to have some pictures. Um, there was a social science study, uh, which I found very interesting. Have you, have you read it, person shaking? You read that study, okay. So the audience knows more than I do about this. Um, this was a study of the experience of evacuees from New Orleans. Um, so it was a social science study, an example of research following the disaster, not during the disaster. I'll say a little bit more about uh, research later. Um, and uh, this study revealed the following. Um, the participants, those who were evacuated and had to be evacuated, were mainly African Americans who had low incomes. It's a ver very large uh, black uh, African American population in uh, uh, New Orleans. Their decision to evacuate was greatly influenced by family, more so by family than by other factors um, um, that were present. And um, I'm not describing the whole study, but I'll have the reference afterwards. Uh, the conclusions of the study were removing the more obvious obstacles uh, to safety of shelter and transportation will likely be insufficient for improving disaster plans for impoverished minority communities. And that is, even if they had done, or in the future will do, what they didn't do in this case was have adequate provisions for shelter. I mean, they were in some large uh, gymnasium or convention hall that didn't have adequate sanitation facilities. I mean, you can imagine putting a whole bunch of people in a place uh, where they have to be sleeping on the floor and there are not toilets for everybody and the toilets overflowed. And so this, they claimed in the study when they did the, the interviews with people, would be inadequate for protection. And uh, this was the family angle here. The important influence of extended families and social networks demand better community-based communication and preparation strategies. So, I mean, that's an interesting lesson because one wouldn't think of that naturally. I mean, you'd think, well, let's set up the facilities and make sure we can get people out and get them into a safe place and have enough sanita uh, sanitation facilities. But this was important. And as you'll see from some comments of the interviewees, they said, these, this is in the study, they've um, um, put in some of the comments of the people who were interviewed. They said, go to Texas, but I didn't know anybody in Texas. 
really, truly, we had cars, but we didn't know anybody to go to. So these were people who did have cars, the majority, or at least many, I don't know if it was the majority, did not even have cars. I mean, if you've got 20 people trying to get into one car, it's not going to happen. Right? So you have cars, but not enough, more people than space. So some people you just stay because you have to. They would have had to send buses like close up to the door so they could get the elderly out. So there's an example of a subpopulation uh, that wasn't adequately uh, prepared for. Um, somebody coming close up and not walking to a station, let's say, where there might be buses or other transportation. More comments. Uh, this was in the language of the people who spoke. I know healthy to drive too far. I take to much, so much medication that uh, by that time I was like groggy. Like my mom said, She's been through Betsy, Camille, all the hurricanes, so the major hurricanes, and she just wasn't evacuating. So I wasn't, go I, just, I wasn't going to leave my mom to stay there by herself. And this goes to people's experience. If there's a big warning, crying wolf, uh, that says, get out of here, get out of here, and then it turns out to be a mild situation, people are going to say, when the next time comes around, they're going to say, well, look, that's what they said with B Betsy, that's what they said with Camille, why should I go? Nothing bad happens. So this is uh, the messages and, and people's response. Some was telling us that we should evacuate, and some of them was telling us to stand by. Inconsistent messaging. So how, is, how are people supposed to respond to that? They respond to the one that they are interested in responding to. And finally, the sociocultural socio reasons, pay attention to this because this does go to the question of justice or at least the perception of injustice. The mayor, the governor of New Orleans that run the city of New Orleans, they let the waters go in poor neighborhoods and kept it out of the rich neighborhoods like that French Quarter where tourists goes at. So here's a, a, an example of the evacuees, the people who were from the area that was affected, and here's their view of how their government takes care of them. And even worse, it was from them opening floodgates, telling lies about the levee breaking and stuff. I believe they, they do these things intentionally so they can flood out those black neighborhoods. Now, this is a very bad indictment of uh, um, people's perception of what governments do when they're not adequately cared for and they're among the poorer population. So um, if those are lessons learned, I mean, it does say uh, go to the poor areas and make sure that they see that, um, um, uh, that they're being cared for and attended to in the same way as the places that the tourists go at. Hurricane Sandy. Um, now, this is going to be some comparisons with Hurricane Sandy in New York that was just less than two years ago. Um, and here, um, I'll come back to lessons from Sandy, but here, two major hospitals right next to each other were hard hit by the storm. This was in lower Manhattan, um, where it's lower Manhattan and it's at sea level, and uh, there's a big river that goes right by, and of course rivers flood when there's a lot of water. Both of these two hospitals carried out major uh, emergency evacuations. NYU Langone Medical Center, as we were discussing before, used to be Tisch. Now it's Langone because he gave more money. Um, it's a private hospital. Um, evacuated 300 patients during the storm. Both of these two hospitals are um, affiliated, are, are uh, medical centers, hospitals where research is done and patient care uh, takes place, both of which are affiliated with a major medical school, which is New York University. So this is the private hospital. They evacuated 300 patients during the storm. The next day, Bellevue Hospital, which is a public hospital, it's uh, run by New York City, uh, even though it's a hospital of NYU Medical Center, it's part of the New York City Public Hospital um, Network. Uh, it's, it, it's referred to as the flagship uh, public hospital in New York City, evacuated 700 patients. Um, and the nearby Veteran Affairs Hospital, uh, called New York Harbor Hospital, evacuated patients before the storm. 
This hospital is run by the Federal uh, Veterans Administration, so it's one of the, it's the only federally, nationally run hospital system in the United States. You know, we have federal, we have state, we have local, et cetera. So this is a federal hospital system. Now, look at the difference here. NYU evacuated patients during the storm. I don't know how they battled all that water and wind, but that's what they did. The next day, after the storm was over, uh, the storm took one day, Bellevue evacuated. The Veterans Hospital evacuated patients before the storm. So this is just some difference that we have to contemplate uh, who makes these decisions and um, how come they're so uncoordinated. Now, it's an extremely interesting story that you can read if you go to, I don't know if I have the exact reference, I think I do, uh, for what happened there in Bellevue. Um, because the, it was a very large hospital, and they did have appropriate um, protections, uh, emergency generated system. Um, and the emergency generated system, uh, system was located on an upper floor, so it wouldn't be affected by flooding in the basement. But there was something else in the basement, some electrical thing uh, that prevented the generators from working, and so it actually was flooded. And the story, which is just spectacular, uh, was how uh, physicians, nurses, aides, um, PAs, and anybody else around uh, were running up and down 17 floors, carrying patients and carrying uh, equipment. Uh, up and down the, the floors of the hospital because the elevators weren't working. So, I mean, it was a, actually a very dramatic picture of, uh, of response and rescue. So, New York hospitals did post-Katrina planning. Now, of course, Katrina couldn't do um, pre-Katrina planning, but these were lessons learned from Katrina, um, which is a very good example of how one can look at something that happened somewhere else uh, where circumstances are likely to be very much the same, and here's what they did. As a result of the um, um, post-Katrina planning, they had capabilities to manage evacuations, that is, they had already planned how to do that, um, and they had transport equipment to move patients within the facility, 350 additional ambul ambulances were brought to the city, this was uh, knowing that Katrina was, I mean, sorry, that Sandy was coming. Uh, they actually took all these steps. Um, there, were, there was rapid response by emergency medical service transport units. Those were both pro properly trained for ra uh, rapid response and succeeded. And FEMA, now under a better direction than the uh, racetrack owner that was appointed by George W. Bush, placed urban search and rescue teams nearby as the, store came, as the storm came ashore. Now, presumably, someone in New York City had to ask New York State, and someone in New York State had to ask FEMA, but uh, they did it all, and so they made those preparations. There's going to be a however uh, in a moment. So because of this post-Katrina planning, these New York hospitals had more detailed emergency plans and access to better positioned backup generators. I mean, clearly that's the, what you need in the hospital because you've got all those patients who are in ICUs and CCUs and NICUs, et cetera. Um, however, Bellevue Hospital, that was the one with the 700 patients, failed to learn a critical lesson from Katrina and that was proper or appropriate planning for the transport of physically disabled or obese patients. Now, one would think that in a country and in a city like New York, but certainly in the country where there is such a high rate of obesity, somebody might actually think about this. There were patients who were too heavy to be carried physically. They were just, you know, morbid obesity and there was not adequate um, um, facilities for that. Now that's something that they could have thought of or might have thought of, but didn't. So sometimes you learn a lot of lessons, but you don't learn all the lessons. Um, and then some people have argued, um, I mean, and given the success and how actually few people in the hospital system, I, I, I can't remember the statistic, but I mean, somewhere between one to three people actually died in the, who were involved in the hospital as opposed to other areas when Sandy uh, hit. Um, but this is a general failure, and this is in my view, and I've dis now discussed this with some people, and of course I've been teaching in <coughs> public health ethics, that leaving these crucial decisions to the healthcare facilities themselves. 
Why on earth, when you have three hospitals, all three of which are in, located very near one another, where the, the CEOs of the hospital or whoever makes those decisions um, left to make the decisions in the way that they did? Well, we'll evacuate during the storm, we'll prepare and evacuate before the storm, and we'll do it the day after. So. Um, this obviously results, and there are probably other examples of this, in inconsistent actions and particularly adverse to patient and public interests. So this is an area that probably requires more attention at the policy level, at the governmental level. And as I just mentioned, these three hospitals made different decisions and they were located in, in, adjacently, equally at risk. Um, earthquake preparedness. Now, uh, remember before I mentioned there's a little difference depending upon what the nature of the disaster is. The hurricane was clearly predicted. And interestingly, just as the uh, one of the respondents in that um, uh, those interviews of the evacuee, evacuees in Katrina in New Orleans, um, just as they said, oh, well, uh, the previous, they told us to evacuate in the past and the hurricane wasn't that bad. Uh, similarly, here in New York, there were people who were, uh, looked at Sandy coming and said, well, they told us to uh, batten down the hatches where Hurricane Irene, and it really wasn't as bad as predicted. So, I mean, this is a, a natural human response. Earthquakes, however, you may have minutes uh, to prepare. Typically, no warnings. But here, the big failure in preparedness is poor building construction in earthquake-prone countries. Now, some of these countries, and places like Haiti, for example, which is probably the single best example, are very poor. Other countries are quite rich, the United States and Japan being examples. And some are both rich and poor, like China. So in 2008, the earthquake uh, in China, this was the one in Sichuan. There have since been at least one more, if not two more. China, I looked at the map of seeing all the places in China that are earthquake prone, and it's really shattering to see how many areas are, are prone to earthquakes. But this was the big one in 2008. And China clearly has um, financial means to construct better buildings. Uh, maybe it's better now in 2014 than it was back in 2008, but this was in a rural area and uh, presumably Sichuan province itself is not as rich as the central government or at least as rich as the super rich people there. Haiti, in contrast, is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere and um, it's, um, um, at people live in abject poverty and the government itself has very few financial means. Haiti was another interesting example of what can follow, um, and that was the unanticipated aftermath in Haiti. Uh, relief workers from Nepal brought cholera to the island. Um, Haiti, cholera had been unknown in Haiti before that. There had never been a cholera outbreak, and to this day, how many years afterwards? Uh, four years later, there's still cholera difficulty in treating cholera, and it's now a, uh, an endemic uh, disease um, in, in Haiti. Um, so this is another example, like the one I gave earlier about uh, Japan tsunami, of a combination disaster, natural and man-made. Now, the natural part, the destruction of buildings, is still there. There was immediate relief, immediate um, um, uh, the Israeli Defense Forces were in there. There were uh, many countries came to do a, a, a immediate relief. But as far as building or rebuilding the infrastructure, basically hasn't happened. There are still people in Haiti who are um, uh, uh, have not recovered themselves in terms of their homes, their livelihood, etc. So this was the uh, Sichuan province uh, in China, and this next picture here. Um, there was one uh, episode, I guess this one was m more in the news than a lot of others, even though there were many people who died and many buildings that, that fell. There was a big school and many children, well, all the children in the school, when the earthquake came, the, the building fell down and these children, so here's a, a father holding a picture of his daughter. And again, they protested the government's inability or the government's poor preparedness in terms of um, uh, building construction. So uh, here's Haiti. Um, and some of these, I, I hope someone here can talk a little more about the refugee camps and the displaced, internally displaced persons because the life there and the problem after a disaster um, uh, creates an ongoing, it's not an emergency situation, it's an ongoing situation that still needs a, a great deal of attention.
Now, I went to look on for some pictures of this. Uh, I don't know anything about earthquake cons about construction. I mean, but there are a whole bunch of build, uh, building uh, uh, images. If you Google, if you Google earthquake construction, you find a whole bunch of images, and maybe you can learn something. So they're showing here the isolation bearings on the other, and the and the reinforcement, you know, and this one. And so apparently, this is engineering that can be done. Now, presumably, if there are huge 7.0 or higher earthquakes, maybe some of these measures aren't even effective, but they are. Um, and uh, earthquake preparation has to be permanent, and it has to be done, of course, well in advance. You can't start building when the earthquake is coming. And there is uh, uh, our very well established uh, procedures and mechanisms and knowledgeable people for earthquake construction, and they exist in Los Angeles and Japan. Los Angeles is on a major fault, and there are very tall buildings um, also in Japan, in different places in Japan, and in Tokyo, and they withstand earthquakes. Um, now, whether they would stand the biggest earthquake the world has ever seen, who knows. But the point is that the minor earthquakes and even some of the major earthquakes, these buildings sway. Uh, my daughter lived for a while in uh, Los Angeles. She now lives in San Francisco, also an earthquake place. And she was in one of those buildings when it was swaying. So you can feel what's going on underneath. And when the building is swaying, you might think, oh, the building's going to fall over. The answer is no, the building is made so, so it can sway and not um, crumble and collapse. So another aspect of earthquake preparedness. But uh, who in Haiti can build they don't have any skyscrapers in Haiti, but who could even uh, begin to do this? They don't have the facility, they don't have the person power, et cetera, to do this. So advanced preparedness or preparation, the situation obviously differs in disasters that can be predicted in advance, um, such as severe disease outbreaks, some of which can be, and many of which also have been, uh, with some skepticism when they're not as serious or as severe as, as predicted. So the um, island, it's not a country, it's off the coast of uh, uh, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, uh, Zanzibar has predictable outbreaks of cholera. They may not know the exact moment that it'll happen, but it is predictable because they are you know, regular and frequent. So there's a way when you know that um, there are these outbreaks of preparing in advance. So in other cases, and I'm going to give a couple of examples now, plans have been made for the allocation of ventilators, preventive vaccines, and allocation of medical treatments for influenza pandemic. The World Health Organization, was, uh, which issues these worldwide um, alerts and, and um, uh, statements about planning, um, uh, was probably overreacted recently and was criticized because it um, um, made a, uh, turned out to be an inaccurate prediction of the effect of, uh, of the influenza, uh, influenza pandemic. That doesn't mean you shouldn't follow it, but uh, this is, again, leads to complacency on the part of people when they say, look, look at this big prediction and all this warning and all this uh, concern, and then it didn't happen. Um, but what is interesting here from an ethical point of view is how allocation schemes for resources differ or may differ and have differed in different places. Some differences depend upon the intervention, uh, that is, what it is that you're providing by way of um, uh, prevention or treatment. And an example of that is vaccines for prevention versus ventilators for care. I can uh, expand on that, but um, I'm going to move forward so I finish when I'm supposed to and have some time, more time for discussion. Other differences. Um, that is, differences other than the intervention are based on differing ethical judgments regarding whom to save. So let me give a couple of examples here. Ventilators in pandemic influenza. The New York State Commission, uh, a New York State Commission, it happens to be a, a, a task force on life and the law, which is a state uh, organized commission, permanent, sits permanently, uh, devised a plan for uh, H1N1 the influenza, and they had clinical guidelines that proposed both withholding and withdrawing ventilators from patients with the highest probability of mortality to benefit patients with the highest likelihood of survival. This, you will quickly realize, is the classic triage situation. This is the wartime triage. This is the classic triage also done in Haiti um, uh, after the earthquake. And interestingly here, 
there was no preference in this plan, which was adopted by the state, no preference for any group based on age, occupation, or other characteristics. Okay, let me stop for a second. Do you think it's ethically acceptable or ethically desirable to make some uh, more, some finer distinctions? Maybe not in the case of the ventilators, but in general. That is, should there be no preference for age or other circumstances, occupation, for example? If you don't have health care workers, if they all get sick, nobody can take care of the sick. If you don't have uh, fire uh, uh, personnel, firefighters um, uh, with uh, prevention or treatment, then they can't be around to prevent fires, sanitation workers, etc. cetera. Um, should there be distinctions based on age? How many think yes? How many think no? How many aren't sure? <laughs> There's always a third question, because only one person raised their hand for each of the other two, and they differed. And if we had a lot of time, maybe I would like to hear you debate, because one person said there should be, and the other said there shouldn't be, right? So obviously, the only um, purpose of this scientific poll is, <laughs> is to show how at least one's intuitive reactions, and maybe there's more than intuitive, some good reasons, justification, um, how that can differ. Um, and I'll give an example here. Um, the ventilators made no such distinctions. Uh, the ethical principle there was save the most lives, and that is not only the principle in triage, but also generally in public health. I mean, a major principle of public health ethics is save the most lives, um, prevent the most deaths. The United States has two committees that often work in concert. The uh, NVAC, the National Vaccine Advisory Committee, and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Policy. Um, why they have to be two when they're both dealing with immunizations, I don't know, but it's a big country. So these are, um, they, they work together in these circumstances, and they jointly recommended a prioritization scheme. Now remember, this is vaccine, it's a prevention, whereas the ventilator situation was for people who are already infected by influenza. They jointly re recommended a, a prioritization scheme placing vaccine workers, healthcare providers, and the ill, the, I'm sorry, the ill elderly at the top, and healthy people aged 2 to 64 at the very bottom. Now, the reason for this, you can see the vaccine workers and healthcare providers quite clearly because they're essential uh, in a, um, a disaster like a big influenza um, um, epidemic. The healthy people aged 2 to 64 have better natural uh, immunity protection. Their immunization systems are better, whereas elderly people to, um, over 64, like me, um, are at the very bottom because the immunization is weakened in those groups. So this obviously has to do with the characteristics of population groups, uh, again, in trying to get the best outcomes. So the primary goal, as stated, um, and, and it's clear from the these, uh, prioritization, was to decrease the health impacts, including severe morbidity and death. And because those impacts are greatest on the uh, populations under two years of age, over 64 years of age, that's why they took the prioritization scheme. How much time do I have? 20 minutes. 20 minutes left? Yeah. Oh, I'll be finished before that so we can have uh, more 15, discussion. Sorry, 15. 15, okay, so I'll go faster. Um, is everybody here an English speaker? Not an American English speaker, but uh, so because when I um, lecture abroad, I have to do much more slowly. But if I can talk fast here for, for the. Okay. So the principle here again was death prevention and health maximization. Um, a secondary goal was minimizing societal and economic impacts, <coughs> and obviously that is related because it's not just the people who are or are likely to fall ill, but it's uh, the impact on those who don't fall ill but who are, um, uh, a as a consequence, uh, if some of the ill people are those who take care of the community, uh, the community needs, etc. cetera. Um, now, this is uh, referred to in the literature as the <laughs> life cycle allocation principle. And it's based on the idea that each person should have an opportunity through all the, to live through all the stages of life. Okay, that's why presumably you look at the young. I'm gonna say a little more about that. Do, do, does one of the sports that you play here in Ireland have innings? Are there any sports that have innings? <laughs> 
<laughs> what? Cricket has innings. Okay. Um, you didn't know cricket has innings? It's not an Irish sport. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you guys can fight about that later. Uh, the reason I ask is that even in the WHO, which is uh, not a uh, UK uh, entity, um, even in the WHO, they use the phrase, which we have in the United States, fair innings. So it's baseball in the United States, which I think uh, is a, an inherited cricket in some way and changed it a lot. Um, so innings then are, you know, it's the units of play. It's like quarters in the other sports. So the fair innings is another way of describing the life cycle principle. Um, now, um, a couple of... Uh, uh, um, authors, which I'll mention in a moment, came up with a modification of the life cycle principles. The life cycle principle was the one um, just mentioned in the NVAC and ASIP, the two uh, U.S. organizations that said save the um, um, first look at the elderly and the young people because they're more um, uh, affected. The investment refinement version of the life cycle principle says the following, sorry about all these words, this according to the authors Emanuel and Wertheimer, gives priority to people between early adolescence and middle age on the basis of the amount the person invested in his or her life balanced by the amount left to live. 20-year-olds are valued more than 1-year-olds. Okay, this is why it's a refinement of the life cycle principle. 20-year-olds are valued more than one-year-olds because the older individuals have more developed <coughs> interests, hopes, and plans, but have not had an opportunity to realize them. So the lack of opportunity to realize them is the life cycle principle, but the fact that they have some developed interests, hopes, and plans makes them different from the one-year-olds because the one-year-olds obviously have no plans. Now, of course, the 20-year-olds haven't contributed anything yet to society. I mean, all they've done has been a drain. You know, they've been uh, t taken care of by their parents, and they've been uh, given a public education. So I don't know about the 20-year-olds, but that's their version now of the life cycle. Of the, it's the investment refinement um, uh, addition to the life cycle principle. And then there's another principle, also these same authors, but we saw it already in the, um, the asip envac uh, example, and that was a principle of public order that focuses on the values of ensuring safety and the provision of necessities, such as food and fuel, and I mentioned police protection, fire protection, et cetera, all those people in a, in a, in a system, uh, whether it's at the community level or the state level or the national level, who are necessary to maintain and, and promote the public order. So this gives high priority to vaccine production and distribution, vaccine production and distribution workers, as well as healthcare and public health workers with direct patient contact. So this is public order. And the priority here, it's important to note, is not because of their social worth, but because they help to ensure public order during an influenza pandemic. So public order principle that may select uh, people in certain categories, like healthcare workers, is not because, you know, well, we paid so much for their medical education. I mean, it's certainly not picking out the uh, Wall Street people and the rich guys, uh, who anyway keep money to themselves and don't do much for charity, but um, it's the importance of certain people in certain occupations for um, preserving the public order. So a quick thing about research in disasters, um, if you're interested in that topic, you can read my chapter in the book. Um, There's 10 minutes left, so if you want to have some time for Q&A. Okay, let me race through. I have a few more slides here. This only repeats in slightly more detail uh, what Donnell said at the beginning, which is, um, you know, it's important to do research um, during a disaster. So. Um, you can read more about that if you're interested. Uh, there's criticism of conducting research in disasters, um, and this is that it takes time away from the actual uh, help, the aid. Um, even after a, a disaster, people are traumatized, et cetera, et cetera, can intrude into rescue operations. So these are all the standard criticisms, but the response to those criticisms is the need for research, uh, in very many ways, like I showed with uh, post-Katrina and how Hurricane Sandy actually, uh, in New York, they learned from the 
disaster. So there's an example from radiation that shows why it is this was a radiation disaster, um, why it is that you have to study radiation because um, there are differences in different types of exposure to radiation, whole body exposure versus fallout from the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. So these are just some specifics that have to do with it. So coming to an end here, Donnell also mentioned the need for research on sex and gender differences. This is the World Health Organization that said there's a lack of research uh, and, and, on, and many more women are affected than men. <laughs> Um, one example, it's just a very simple example, um, and, and it does answer the question why it is that women uh, are more prone to it. If it's something like an earthquake or a tornado, or the earthquakes that occur, uh, women are in the home and the homes collapse and they get injured or die. Men are out in the fields basically, or they're working in a rural area and they're not as likely to be, to be damaged. So if you're in a building, you're at greater risk and women are more likely to be in a building than men, at least in a rural area. So that's one explanation. <clears throat> and then, of course, the last item here, which is critically important, that the sex industry often becomes part of the interaction between refugee and displaced uh, population and the local community. So conclusions, I have one slide of conclusions and then I'm finished. Disaster preparedness and response involve complex ethical decisions that arise from uncertainty about the severity, where the impact will be worst, whether and how preparations will work. Conflicting ethical principles exist regarding whom to save. We saw that in the two answers um, that differed on uh, the elderly and the young. There's a difficulty in planning and coordination uh, that with different uh, uh, governmental and humanitarian agencies. I gave the example in Katrina, but it's even perhaps even more so when there are humanitarian agencies that come in from outside and are not part of the government, directly part of the governmental response. There's a difficulty predicting the responses of individuals and community, and the illustration for that is the study that was done of the evacuees in, uh, um, uh, in New Orleans. And lessons learned from past episodes should be recorded and applied in the future. Obviously, a not very highly um, complex difficulty to learn. So that's the end. And I do have, for anybody who's interested, a bunch of references. The first one is the one on the, uh, uh, the social science study of Katrina. Uh, this is a, a different reference here on conducting research in disease outbreaks. This is the one about the uh, uh, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine about the rescue operations. Uh, this one is about the, whoops, let's go, I didn't do this right. Um, this is uh, from JAMA uh, about the, um, um, the ventilators. And then finally, uh, Hank Tenhavi in, the, in this book. So I'm finished. Sorry I took so long.